in Psalms 19. David says that the heavens declare the glory of God, and how true that is. In fact, the glory of God can be seen in every area of life. The creation of man also declares the glory of God. To study man and all of the wondrous handiwork that went into designing him is to catch a glimpse of the Almighty. And someone can study man or beast or the heavens or the earth, but particularly when st- someone can study man and, and not see the hand of God. Instead, see a big bang, a mutating microorganisms. Their minds have been blinded by sin, by the God of this world. Satan himself. We talked last week about the human eye and the ability to see the miracle of sight. I want us to start this morning by considering another of our five senses, the miracle of hearing. Ordinary conversation causes air molecules to vibrate and move the eardrum, a microscopic one ten thousandth of a centimeter, or approximately four one hundred thousandths of an inch. Vibrations caused occur with such precision that we are able to differentiate all the different sounds of human speech. The eardrum membrane has enough flexibility to register the sound of the drop of a straight pin, the noise of a New York subway, 100 trillion times louder. The ear is about as sensitive as it can possibly be. The ear sensitivity increased by just a tiny amount, and we would hear the movement of air molecules and a constant wishing sound, a constant sound of motion. In fact, this affliction actually does plague some people with disastrous hallucinatory results in their lives. After the eardrum vibrates, three tiny bones known as the hammer, the angle, and the stirrup transfer that vibration to the middle ear. These three bones have been called the most remarkable bones in all of the human body. Unlike every other bone that you have in your body, these do not grow with age. In fact, a one-day-old infant has them already fully developed. They will never grow in his entire lifetime. They are in constant, unrelieved motion, since every sound that reaches us causes them to swing into action. They're constantly, constantly moving, never stopping. Working together, they magnify the force that vibrated the eardrum until it is 20 times greater than when it first entered your ear. Inside an inch-long chamber known as the organ of corte, the force that began with molecules of air and was converted to a mechanical pounding finally ends up as a turbulent fluid force. The action of the three bones sets up pulsating waves in the liquid inside the sealed organ of corte. Everything that we know of as sound depends upon this seismic chamber. How are we able to distinguish two different sounds, such as the buzz of a fly droning about the room and the dull muffled roar of a lawnmower engine a block away? How can we differentiate between all different kinds of sounds? Every distinct sound has a signature, quote-unquote, if you will, a signature of vibrations per second. If you hear a wave of molecules oscillating at 256 times per second, for example, you are hearing the musical middle C. The average person can detect can detect vibrations from 20 to 20,000 cycles per second. Inside the organ of quite 25,000 sound receptor cells line up to receive these vibrations like strings of a piano waiting to be struck. Seen through an electron scanning microscope, the cells resemble rows of baseball bats all lined up upright together. Each cell is designed to respond to a certain pattern, a certain pattern of sound. A few of these cells will fire off signals to the brain when a 256 cycle vibration reaches them and you hear a middle C. The others will await their own programmed frequency. You just imagine the cell activity when you sit in front of a full orchestra, and you hear 12 different notes at one time, as well as a variety of musical textures from the different instruments, and yet God designed our body to be able to do that. In all, we are told that the human ear distinguishes some 300,000 different tones, that the human ear is capable of distinguishing that many different tones. 
And considering this miracle of hearing, another one of so many miracles that we take for granted and we think so little about, it is important to note that the vibration itself never reaches the brain. The process resembles a cassette tape, if you will, which absorbs sound and does not do it as mechanical vibration, but as a series of electrical and magnetic codes. And once the vibration excites or activates its appropriate sound receptor cell, then the forces inside the head, the force inside the head changes from mechanical to electrical. Thousands of wires or neurons lead from the path of 25,000 cells into the auditory part of the brain. And there the frequencies are received in a series of on-off blips, if you will. Our experience of sound is brought about by interpreting the message from the cells. Depends on which cells transmit their signals, how often, and in cooperation with what other cells. The brain, in turn, pieces these messages together. And we hear distinguishable sound, and we can interpret it. Almost unbelievably, the organ in our body that needs the most energy, the organ in the human body that needs the most energy is not the heart. It's not the brain. They tell us it's the inner ear that needs the most energy in our body. With all of the senses that we have, we cannot interpret them at all. We cannot make sense of them at all until the human mind has taken it, interpreted it, and made sense of it. They tell us that five trillion chemical operations are occurring in our brain at any given second. Five trillion. The brain is constantly being bombarded with messages not only from the five senses, but literally from the entire body. In fact, every one, every one of the 100 trillion cells in your body has direct access to the brain, every single one of them. Many cells, such as those used in sight, have direct neuronal connections. Others have channels immediately available to them to report in on their needs and current condition. But every cell in your body has direct connection to your brain. The evolutionists would like you to believe that we have gone from an original one-celled speck to a 100 trillion celled creature, and that that progress and advancement was made through evolution. It would be impossible to accurately calculate the odds of getting just one million cells to work in detailed and perfect harmony through happen chance. The statistical odds would be beyond our comprehension this morning. To imagine not just one million cells, but literally 100 trillion cells operating in an orderly fashion in a human body uh, as an eventual result of a big bang billions of years ago is the height of arrogance and ignorance. In addition to sight and hearing and touch and taste and smell, there are vital senses that inform us of our muscle fatigue, tension, a pressure on joints and tendons. There are sensors that will inform your body when it's lunchtime and you'll start to feel hungry. By the way, not yet. If your sensors are telling you such, they're malfunctioning. And you know instinctively that the tilt of your head and the, the bend of your elbow and the position of your feet, you know those things instinctively. You know if you're hungry or thirsty. You know if you're tired or uncomfortable. You know if you're nervous or you're excited as all of the stations of your body report in below the conscious level. Automatic systems adjust the chemical components of your blood. They control the air pressure in your lungs. They control the blood pressure, monitor the blood pressure in your arteries. They monitor and regulate all the delicate balances of your body that are so necessary for you to continue to live and function as you do. And yet we just take it for granted. The entire brain, in the entire brain, only one cell out of a thousand reports in from out all the outlying areas of the body. All visual images, all sounds, all touch and pain sensations, all smells, all the monitors of blood pressure and chemical changes, the sensations of hunger and thirst, 
all the data that comes in from the rest of your body occupies only one-tenth of one percent of the brain cells. Two-tenths of one percent of cells control all motor activities. The motions involved in playing a piano, typing a letter, riding a bike, the skills necessary to play baseball or basketball or football or to uh, engage in a job to do work. Two-tenths of one percent of the brain cells are involved with that. The vast, overwhelming majority of your brain cells are used in a mind-boggling network of intercommunication to allow the processes that we know as thought and free will, the ability to make decisions and to reason. Unlike a telephone switchboard that connects single subscribers indirectly through a central switching station, each nerve cell in the brain has up to 10,000 of its own private lines, if you will. Brain biologist J.Z. Young likens the network to 10 billion bureaucrats constantly phoning each other about plans and instructions for keeping a country running. He likens your brain to that. Around the perimeter of each nerve cell, dendrites reach out and form connections with other neurons, in effect linking each cell with wires from an entire city. Each connection listens in for the patterns of impulses it receives and their average rate of arrival and decides whether or not to continue the message by firing off chemicals along its thousands of other connections. Physiologically, the whole mental process comes down to these billions of cells spurting irritating chemicals at each other across the synapses or the gaps between the connections. The web of nerve cells defies description or depiction. They tell us that one cubic millimeter, the size of a pinpoint, contains one billion connections among cells. And then a mere gram of brain tissue may contain as many as 400 billion synaptic junctions. As a result, each cell can communicate with every other cell at lightning speed as if a population far larger than the entire world's population, in fact, larger than everybody that has ever lived, could be linked together so that all the inhabitants could talk to each other at once. It is said that the brain's total number of connections rivals the stars in the entire universe. The hundreds of trillions of trillions of stars there. The human brain weighs around three pounds, give or take a few ounces here or there. The many folds of the brain increase the outer surface of the brain 30 times, 30 fold. In that three pound mass, there are 100,000 miles, 100,000 miles of nerve fibers. The brain is that which gives meaning to life. Nothing is comprehended until the brain makes sense of it and interprets it for us. The brain presents the world to you and to me, not in data banks and blips and jolts, but wholly and conceptually and meaningfully. And herein is a miraculous thing. The mind, the brain, the human brain that co coordinates all this profound activity lies locked away inside your skull. The brain itself never sees. In fact, if you opened it up to light, you could cause irreparable harm. The brain itself never hears. It is too sheltered and cushioned to be impacted by sound. The brain does not experience touch. There are no touch or pain cells there. Its temperature varies by no more than a few degrees. In all actuality, it has never felt hot or cold. It never sustains a mechanical force. If it were to come in contact with one, it would quickly lapse into unconsciousness. Everything that forms you and everything that forms me reduces down to a sequence of dots and dashes reporting from millions of outposts into a brain housed away in a protective bony container that has never directly experienced those sensations. Whether it be the prick of a pin or the taste of ice cream or the sound of a violin or the sight of the Grand Canyon or the smell of a pizza, 
all of those reach our consciousness via signals that are virtually almost identical. We perceive them because tiny neurons have shot chemicals at each other, literally. Your brain contains the person that you are. Every other cell in your body ages and is replaced at least every seven years. Your skin and eyes and heart and bones are entirely different than those you carried around just seven years ago. Your taste buds live only three to five days before they die and are replaced. In all respects but one, you are a different person, the exception being your neurons and nerve cells. They are never replaced, and they maintain the continuity of you of who you really are. Further wonder of the brain is its ability it has to recreate sensations that are long since past. You close your eyes and concentrate, not now but later. Some of you have already closed your eyes and you've long since started concentrating. But you can hear waves crashing upon the rocks and you can see the Grand Canyon and you can smell the pungent odor of a skunk and you can taste dinner maybe even. You wince as you remember when you got your hand sliced open when the knife slipped. Or you remember the feelings of concern when you lost your job. The feelings of elation when you got married or a child was born or some other great thing happened in your life. You go to sleep at night and your mind takes you on different tours and adventures. You experience fear and excitement and wonder and dread. You know joy and sorrow and laughter and fun. You find a hundred dollars that doesn't exist except in your mind, and when you wake up, it's gone. And yet, there is no force, no external stimulation, no vibration of molecules, no firing of sound receptor cells, no impulses slamming into the visual cortex. But still, you hear and see and react and laugh, etc. Your mind creates sights and sounds out of what only exists in the complex of nerve cells jammed into every inch of your mind. They say that most people dream in black and white and not in color. I have a hard time with that. I know I've got to be one of those who dream in color. Do you ever have those times when you think, is this a dream? I would like to think that if all of a sudden everything was black and white, it would at least concern me. I would realize that I was dreaming. Next time you wonder, am I dreaming? Don't pinch yourself. Just check and see if everything is black and white. If it's black and white, then you're dreaming. Complex activity that goes on in the human mind is way beyond our human comprehension. We can only understand it in a limited way. The splendor and grandeur and magnificence of creation is seen whenever and wherever you, you take the time to look for it, and often even when you don't. But nowhere is it more evident than in the human mind. God displayed tremendous talent when He made the human brain. How has man shown His gratitude and praise and thankfulness? How has He shown His wonder and appreciation toward a God who put such love and care into His creation of man? How has man expressed His thanks by denying that God even exists. By declaring that man came not from the hand of an almighty, omniscient God, but from some primeval slop out of which some primitive speck oozed. That's how man has shown his gratitude to God. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. To 
further show his arrogance. Man has corrupted and defiled and prostituted and perverted every gift that God has ever given him. We talked last week about our eyes and what a sin it is to waste them on pornography or covetousness or five hours of television day after day after day. What a pity to use them to read romance novels or watch slop operas or read the National Enquirer. What a disgrace to waste those wonderful organs watching Phil Donahue or Oprah or Geraldo. What ingratitude to waste our ears listening to rock music or rap music or gospel rock or gospel rap as if there could be such a thing. Or even country western music. To fill them with gossip. To listen to filth and garbage. What a pity! What a travesty of justice! to take the wonderful creation that God has given to us, the gift that's come from Him, and use it and pervert it and corrupt it by filling our own lusts and satisfying our own filthy desires. What thankfulness to take our mouths. What ingratitude to God to take our mouths and use them to utter lies and spew out cursing and anger. Perhaps it is the height of arrogance and wretchedness to take the mouth that God gave you and use it to curse His very name. What a shame to use that mouth to pour alcohol down your throat. What haughtiness and insolence to take the brain that God gave us, our incredibly complex and marvelously fashioned brain, and fill it with sewage. And fill it with thoughts and imaginations and fantasies that are wicked. Genesis 6, 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. We live in such a day today where men literally have so corrupted and so defiled even that which is holy and good that every imagination of the thoughts of their heart is only evil continually, steeped in wickedness. What an insult to God to take our mind and meditate upon thoughts of evil or revenge or jealousy or lust or foolish desire. Then, as if man hasn't done enough damage and disgrace to the creation of God, he takes man which is made in the very image of God and hacks up his hair and bulls, bores holes in not just his earlobe anymore, but his whole ear, his nose, his cheek, his lips even, his whole body. The entire business is devoted to body piercing of all things. You study pagan cultures and you'll find that the further they get from God, the further man gets from God, the more he tries to destroy and alter even the very body which God gave him. God made man in his own image. When man turns from God, eventually he wants to destroy anything and everything that God has made. Psalm 96 is, Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord. Bless His name. Show forth His salvation from day to day. Declare His glory among the heathen. His wonders among the people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heaven. Honor and majesty are before Him. Strength and beauty are in His sanctuary. Verse 10 says, Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar and the fullness thereof. Let the field be joyful and all that is therein. Then shall all the trees of the wood rejoice before the Lord. For He cometh where He cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people. With his truth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. You can believe in evolution if you want. In spite of all the facts and evidences against evolution, you can cling to it until you die if that's your desire. But oh, you must know that one day God is going to judge the world. Not according to the theory of evolution, but according to truth. According to truth. Psalm 97.2 says, Clouds and darkness are round about Him. Righteousness and judgment of the habitation of His throne. God's very nature is righteous. Righteousness and judgment of the habitation of His throne. The heavens declare His righteousness. And all the people see His glory. Oh, Psalm 113.3 says, From the rising of the sun and to the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. From the rising of the sun and to the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. And yet how often we waste our time praising things that are of no importance, living for things that aren't going to last very long at all. Psalm 33 and verse 5 says, He loveth righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of the goodness of the earth of the Lord. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. 
Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let the, all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. For He spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Imagine that. The God who made your brain. He spake and it was done. He spake and it was done. Man in all of his education for all of his efforts can't create anything that even begins to approach into the human brain. All the, all the countless millions of man hours that have gone into such a project. And then you look at Almighty God. He spake and it was done. He spake and it was done. Psalm 34, verse 2, My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. Verse 3, O magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His name together. O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in Him. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and His ears are open unto their cry. Have you ever wondered how God can keep track of five billion people at once? He made your brain in which five trillion chemical reactions occur each and every instant all in perfect order and harmony. Five billion people is no big deal for him. He looked at the wonder of God's creation, the audacity of man's response. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. And by the way, as soon as you say there is no God, it changes how you live. So the Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They're all gone aside. They're all together become filthy. There is none to do with good, no, not one. He looked at the wonder of God's creation, the audacity of man's response. So how has man, how has God responded to man's ungracious, unthankful response? John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 